I'm a vision scientist. And what I do is I investigate how the eye works, and I develop new technologies to improve vision. Well, scientists, what that scientists do is they ask questions, uh, and they figure out ways to get the answers. And I'm pretty sure that every one of you have an inner scientist who asks questions. And probably you ask many questions looking at the stars in the starry night, right? Like the question, how many stars are they? How bright they are? How far they are? Can we see them better? Astronomers have figured out ways better. They have, they have uh, developed um, like telescopes. And they have a um, couple of these uh, telescopes, adaptive optics. Adaptive optics, they project a laser beam through the atmosphere. And then they measure the degrading effects of the atmospheric turbulence. See the stars better. I investigate the eye. And the eye is probably the most amazing optical instrument that you can imagine. And in fact, what we do is we uh, translate, move forward these technologies that have been developed for astronomy to the investigation of the eye. The eye, as I said, is composed by lenses. It has the cornea and the crystalline lens. And those lenses project the images of the outside world on the retina, where the photoreceptors capture the light and convert that into electrical signals that travel all the way to the brain. But the eye as fascinating as it is, it's not perfect. The images that are projected by the lenses get blurred, um, and, um, and they're, not, they're not absolutely perfect. But we can measure these imperfections. And in fact, we're using this technology developed for astronomy, this Harmonstadt Wafer Sensor, and translated that into the eye. And we do something similar to what astronomers did with the telescopes, shine a ray of light to the back of the eye, and we analyze the wave of light that emerges through the eye and measure these imperfections. The most well-known imperfections in the eye are refractive errors. In a perfect eye, in an emetropic eye, images are projected on the retina. However, in, a, for example, a myopic eye, a nearsighted eye, the images are projected in front of the retina. And we need glasses, we need spectacles to bring that image to the retinal plane. Spectacles have been used for centuries. This is a painting by El Greco with this cardinal wearing glasses, and celebrities wear glasses as well. In fact, lots of people in the world wear, wear glasses. Myopia affects 30% of the population in Western countries, and actually more than 90% in some areas in the world, like Hong Kong or Singapore. But in fact, there are many people blind in the world because of the lack of uh, corrections. There are visual impairment due to uncorrected refractive errors that the World Health Organization has measured, estimated to be about 153 million blind people because of the lack of a, of a correction. Why this happens? Well, what we can say is that we can actually improve quality of light by a lot by putting someone's glasses. And eyeglasses are not the bottleneck. Eyeglasses can be as cheap as $4. It's probably the one... Uh, cost-effective health care technology. However, the reason why there are so many people uncorrected is because of the lack of specialists. Optometrists are not as um, many as they should be. In the US or in uh, Europe, there is one optometrist every uh, 6,000 people. However, you go to rural India, there is one optometrist every 250,000 people, even less in, in Africa. So. When the Iker specialists come in this bus, probably once a year, there are these long lines that are formed just to get a prescription because you need an optometrist that puts lenses and measure prescriptions for, for some time or you need uh, expensive technology. So there is a recognized need for getting these technologies that are affordable and are accurate to get the prescription without the need of a specialist. And this is what we did in our lab. We brought these technologies, these big technologies, sitting on the table with lasers, lenses, into something very small, something affordable, that at the click of a button can get you a prescription. So bringing accurate autorefraction anywhere. This is an example of a spin-out company that was formed between MIT 
and uh, CSIC in, in Madrid. And what is more important is that these technologies are now being brought to the patients and the people in need. It's now being used in, uh, in India to get these prescriptions and, and get these people's uh, glasses. We explore the eye very much as astronomers explore planets. Uh, the astronomers quantify the topography, for example, of, of planets. Uh, this is a, an image by NASA uh, exploring the planet Mercury. Well, we explore the topographies of these lenses in the eye, like the cornea, the shapes of the crystalline lenses, and develop these technologies that allow us, for example, to guide cataract surgery. We can implant an intraocular lens, and with these uh, quantitative technologies, we can select the intraocular lens that is best adapted to the anatomy of an eye. So we uh, saw these technologies used as astronomers that allow us to measure the imperfections and the uh, degradation imposed by the atmosphere. Well, astronomers have developed this instrumentation to actually correct the aberrations, the, the imperfections of the atmospheric turbulence. We are using the same technology to correct the aberrations of the eye. For example, moving from uh, these big systems into something very small, something that can be worn in the eye to simulate uh, a particular correction. So those instruments that move forward from astronomy to optical instruments in the lab can now be, be worn by a patient. They can actually see the world through a correction that is going to be implanted in their eye, giving them the experience of a correction before actually having a surgery. And again, this is another example of technology being moved forward from astronomy to the lab and now to the clinic. Uh, and this is a spin-off company that was created in my lab two years ago to bring this technology to the patients. We not only get inspiration from astronomy, we also get inspiration from nature. For example, we look at some animal eyes, like geckos, to get inspired to create multifocal corrections. These are corrections that project you a simultaneous image, an image that is focused for far and near at the same time to correct for your presbyopia. Eventually, these designs can be get into a patient's eye. But we also get inspiration from the crystalline lens. The crystalline lens of a young eye has the ability to accommodate, to focus near and far. And this is the technology that we have used and developed to uh, image this uh, accommodating crystalline lens. We can look at the structure of the crystalline lens and get a lot of information that is useful to create new lenses, to get inspired to get new corrections. This will be the future of our correction for presbyopia. Right now, corrections of presbyopia are static. We want a dynamic correction for near and, and far. We are getting inspired by the accommodating nature of the crystalline lens to design these lenses that get reshaped upon an accommodation stimulus. So I hope next time you see the stars, you can imagine how we can use light and optics to improve vision and how these technologies that once started in astronomy are now moving forward to increase eye care access to patients in need to provide them with glasses and they're now being used to improve cataract surgery, a surgery that is performed 22 million uh, surgeries per year or actually restore visual function. So I hope you can imagine how we can use light to see the light. Thank you for your attention.